Why are some people bendy AF? People are gonna think it's fake. No, no way. <laughs> no way. What are you talking about? And is bending like this bad for your back? Because if so, today's special guests are in trouble. I've got a whole host of incredible performers joining me as we dive into the science of extreme contortion and explore whether it causes problems later on in life. Our first special guest is Alexi Goloboroko, a Cirque du Soleil performer with unbelievable flexibility, who has been training his body for a very, very long time. On his Wikipedia page, it says that Alexi's mother relates stories about how his natural flexibility was such that he would start strangers on buses or shop assistants fitting him with shoes even when he was a very young child and lo and behold his Instagram links to a page dedicated to contortionist feats that he performed in his youth obviously contorting the body comes naturally to him taking center stage at the children's circus festival at only 13 years old That is not to take anything away from the effort involved in refining and maintaining his hypermobility. In his youth, Alexei trained with a performance coach named Vladislav Avinisevich Rodin in what Rodin calls a synthesis of classical dance, gymnastics, rhythmic gymnastics, modern dance, martial arts, and extreme flexibility of the body. Even his warm ups are mind boggling. But wait, there's more. This next one is difficult to wrap your head around. He's showing hypermobility in several planes of movement at the same time, performing a deep bend with enough spinal rotation to simultaneously make it into a side bend. A caption on one of his videos denotes the difference between passive, assisted by weight or a training partner, and active flexibility, which the performer can achieve using their own muscles and explains that the performer displays active flexibility while on stage. It's obvious he is very knowledgeable about flexibility. And I can attest that if there were a way to make these or any other flexibility maneuver as safe as possible, it would be in working to achieve them actively by improving the active range of motion where the muscles are engaged while extended. I'm glad to see he has continued to explore this concept in his adulthood. Okay, hold up. If your bench press doesn't look like this, do you even lift, bro? This last video is actually a demonstration of passive mobility, where his back bend is accentuated by the added weight of the barbell. And let's be real, the average person, no matter how hard they train, is unlikely to achieve such incredible mobility. In the previously mentioned caption, Alexi also mentions skeleton flexibility and refers to a person's innate ability to bend. As you may imagine, some people are born more flexible than others. Alina Rupel of Flexi Lady fame is another such person. Like Alexi, she began training at a young age, nine years old to be exact, when her mother initially noticed her talent. An article from abenderfan.com detailing her career reads, early on in her training, Alina trained under the guidance of legendary German contortion and gymnastics coach Gerd Raskin, and also her mother. This story sounds a lot like Alexi's. At this stage, Alina's incredible skills were quite apparent and very quickly the Rupel backbend was created. A Bender fan also provides photos of this early feat. And the article reads, For it to be a perfect Rupel backbend, the legs must be straight with the shoulders through the legs. Very extreme. And I'm sure you won't be surprised to learn that this move is one that very few have mastered. Maybe others are attempting the move? Better, faster, stronger. So if immediately upon the onset of her training, she was able to achieve the pinnacle of contortion, 
Then her training was for maintenance and to compensate for increasing muscle stiffness with age. Although evidence points to an increase in muscle stiffness with aging, movement and strength training can help to slow this effect. Now, I won't bore you with an exhaustive list of contortionists who showed signs of hypermobility very young, but rest assured that many people in this profession share a similar inborn propensity towards being bendy AF. So, is there some genetic precondition that allows some people to do this kind of thing? There are a couple of possible explanations. Enter Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Oh no! I said, enter Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Oh yeah! While researching for this video, I discovered a short article with excellent citations about the science of contortion by a man named Jim Pickles. Well into his 70s, Jim is still performing feats of flexibility that would put many younger people to shame. Kudos to you, Jim. I hope you're out there watching. In his article, Jim points out, there was an early view in the medical profession from Baton, Graham, and others that contortion arises from collagen diseases. That is, they suggest that contortion is a variant of the joint hypermobility syndrome, such as Marfan syndrome or Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which arises from mutations in the genes coding for collagen and related molecules. The Mayo Clinic gives us a list of symptoms associated with Marfan syndrome. Tall and slender bill, disproportionate long arms, legs, and fingers, a breastbone that protrudes outwards or dips inwards, a high arched palate and crowded teeth, heart murmurs, extreme nearsightedness, an abnormally curved spine, and flat feet. As you can tell, many of the symptoms associated with this disorder have identifiable physical implications none of which seems to be present in Alexi and Elena. And although symptoms can indeed be mild, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome may be the more likely explanation here. Ehlers-Danlos syndromes are a group of conditions characterized by skin hyperextensibility, atrophic scarring, joint hypermobility, and generalized tissue fragility. Human connective tissue, which connects other tissues and is a major component of bone, skin, muscles, tendons, and cartilage, is a complex mixture of proteins and other substances that that provides strength and elasticity to the underlying structures in your body. The most abundant of these proteins is collagen, whose fiber-like structure adds flexibility and strength to connective tissue. People with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome have a faulty gene that leads to weak collagen or not enough normal collagen. Genes encoding fibrillar collagens or collagen modifying enzymes have been identified in most forms of EDS, including the classical and vascular subtypes and the rare arthrochalasias, kyphoscoliosis, and dermatosporaxis variants. But to date, the genetic background of the hypermobility type of EDS remains unclear. The resultant overly flexible joints can cause joint dislocation. And chronic pain and stretchy fragile skin can be problematic when injury occurs. Imagine needing stitches in skin that isn't strong enough to hold the thread. There are other less obvious implications of a collagen deficiency, including ruptures of major blood vessels or other internal organs, like the intestines, whose walls are weakened. Pregnancy can increase the risk of a rupture in the uterus. Critics of this Ehlers-Danlos explanation for extremely bendy people contrast the fragility aspect of this disorder with the strength and fitness exhibited by the contortionist. How could someone who can do this be suffering from a condition that makes them more fragile? That doesn't make any sense! Granted, we don't know what is happening behind closed doors, but it doesn't sound like Alexi is suffering while performing these feats. I can sell my body in all the shapes, all the positions as I want. It feels awesome. It's like having a superpower. He's even cracking jokes while his body is contorted like a pretzel. Many people ask me weird questions. Alexi, do you have bones? And I often say, yes, I do have bones, but before I go to work, I leave them at home. And as a featured performer that tours with Cirque du Soleil, his performing schedule is pretty demanding, not leaving a lot of room for injury. As with any condition there, the severity of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome exists on a spectrum. It can be mild and likely in many people remains undiagnosed, while others with hereditary Ehlers-Danlos have significant or even severe pain and disability. Maybe if he sees this video, a 
Alexi can contact me and let us know if he has this disorder or not. I am obviously not the only one who is curious. If only there was another famous contortionist who is outspoken about their Ehlers-Danlos diagnosis who can shed more light on this situation. He's been called a medical mystery but Daniel Browning Smith calls himself Rubber Boy. Interns, meet our next special guest, Rubber Boy. The secret to his jaw-dropping flexibility that's gotten Daniel to Hollywood? I'm diagnosed with a disease called EDS. Now, one thing I noticed about Daniel is that his version of contortion really takes advantage of joint capsule laxity and joint dislocation. Now my hand is totally dislocated. Oh, good. Does anyone else's shoulder hurt? Just watch Daniel bend the rules of nature as he rotates his arm 360 degrees. These types of moments are more prominent in Daniel's routine than in Alexi's, who relies heavily on hypermobile backbends and split variations. My genre is called dancing contortion. It's a mix of different disciplines. The base is contortion, being bendy and flexible. Alexi goes on to highlight the components of his unique act. And other disciplines such as hand balance, elements of rhythmic gymnastics, elements of ballet dance, elements of modern dance. It is possible that variations in their training regimens such as this can account for the differences in their performance styles. Daniel's movements are raw and jarring, relying more on the sudden shock factor of his body's unique flexibility. Thankfully, he seems to have a fairly mild form of EDS, stating in his ABC interview, my ribs actually dislocate and poke out of my chest, and I do have some muscle pain, but it's very minor, so I've been very lucky. It's safe to say that some people who suffer from Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome have turned weakness to strength and found a home in the field of contortion. Although we can't confirm that Alexi has Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, a side-by-side -side comparison between him and Rubber Boy yields some useful information. In both men, there is an obvious but slightly different propensity towards bending. It's possible that Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome could manifest differently in both performers, allowing them to specialize in different movements, or that Alexi's multifaceted training has enhanced his inborn talent. I don't need anything else. Just body and that's it. Jim Pickles mentions, while laxity may mean that contortionists tend to dislocate their joints relatively easily, with training, they are able to strengthen and protect joints, allowing them to perform incredible feats. Best of both worlds. You get the best. Still, it is hard to reconcile strength like Alexi's with connective tissue weakness. And as a result, some have suggested that Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and contortion are separate phenomena, presumably with different molecular bases. The molecular basis for contortion, Ehlers-Danlos, and other diseases that affect connective tissue is still obscure. But Jim goes on to point out that there is emerging view that all hypermobility syndromes, benign or not, may be related and may be part of the same spectrum of phenomena, though with different outcomes in different individuals. An article published in the American Journal of Medical Genetics explores this idea further. The number of hereditary neuromuscular disorders featuring generalized joint hypermobility syndrome is increasing, and the boundaries with hereditary connective disorders is not always clear cut. This chart presents hypotheses on the relationship between joint hypermobility syndrome and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, hypermobility type within the broader group of generalized joint hypermobility. Say that five times fast. No. The main takeaway is that the genetic delineations between joint hypermobility syndrome and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome may not be as clear cut as some would like to believe. From a practical perspective, many clinicians consider joint hypermobility syndrome and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome to be one and the same. Interestingly, the most effective treatment for JHS is to improve muscle strength and fitness so that the joints are better protected. This is very helpful for EDS as well. Keep in mind that no matter your genetic starting point, it is possible to improve the stability of your joints by strengthening the stabilizing muscles that cross and surround 
those joints in question. Joint hypermobility syndrome is diagnosed after other possible conditions such as Ehlers-Danlos have been ruled out. It can exist in isolation or as part of a more complex diagnosis and can even be localized, affecting only some of the body's joints. We use the Baton score to measure hypermobility. It is a simple system that gives a score between one and nine as the individual performs five different exercises where the higher the score, the higher the laxity. I'm pretty lax. I'll just go ahead and give Alexi nines across the board. I train three to five hours per day to maintain my flexibility and my other disciplines that I have. On second thought, make it tense. It is entirely possible that this man has JHS and not EDS hypermobility type, and his physical training has helped him manage the negative effects of the disorder. However, Professor Pickles warns us. <laughs> Some performing contortionists go on to develop clear signs of EDS later in life. So Alexi may not be out of the woods just yet. Hey, let's learn about things that are opposite. When it comes to Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, hypermobility tends to dominate early in life, while other symptoms tend to dominate later in life. These are the opposite. So we'll just have to wait and see what happens. As time passes, the accumulated effects of such extreme body bending may also lead to adverse results. A 2008 publication from the Journal of Neurosurgery and Spine used MR imaging and a variety of other metrics to determine spine health in long-term contortion practitioners. This image shows the spines of all participants. The study's findings show an increase in pain and adverse health implication for older practitioners, or for those who had been practicing longer among those closer in age. All of the women who took part in the study were from the circus school in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, known for producing elite contortionists and had been practicing for a minimum of eight years at the time of the study. Most of them had started practicing between the ages of six and eight with one exception. From a very young age, these kids undergo rigorous training. This is not your average day in a class. This is not your average day in class. Interestingly, the youngest practitioner, 20 years old at the time of the study, with the least experience in contortion, only eight years, presented with the least problems and was the only one without chronic back pain or scoliosis. So at a surface level, it would seem that a lifetime of rigorous training can take its toll on your spine. But Amy Go, a skilled contortionist from BendyDiaries.com, asks us not to overlook the fact that these women train many hours a day and perform multiple times a week without break. And in doing so, overuse injuries are prone to occur. They're really not playing around. She adds that the same principle can be applied to any other profession. Football, ballet, dance, swimming, etc. And to say that contortion is any riskier than any other physically demanding sport is actually misleading. <laughs> She then cites a study from the 2009 American Journal of Sports Medicine that has some interesting findings. It compares injury patterns and rates in circus performers to those present in other sports and concludes that although circ shows are highly athletic and acrobatic with jumps and tethered and untethered aerial maneuvers, the injury rates are less than those for NCAA women's gymnastics and similar to those of NCAA men's basketball. Basketball. In addition, the estimated rate of injuries that result in more than 10 missed days is much less. The study didn't isolate contortion from other circus acts, but still the results are a springboard for some interesting questions. Is it more taxing to perform high-level contortion than it is to perform any other high-level sport? Can contortion be practiced successfully into old age without sacrificing health? The world's oldest contortionist, Christine Danton, has something to say about that. When she was young, Christine Danton could fold her body in half and slide it through a 13-inch hoop. But the passage of time hasn't taken much from her. More than half a century later, Christine is still performing that same trick. Well, I'm 71 now, and I've been doing this since I was four. An interview with the Daily Telegraph reveals an interesting process. Now in her 71st year, Christine trains twice a week with a well-rounded 75-minute routine of backbends, 
forward bends and the splits. Most contortionists can only go backwards or forwards, but not both. She does each set three times, gaining more flexibility with each repetition. A more sustainable practice like this, with ample time to rest and recover between sets, may be excellent for someone of her age, but could also be more sustainable for a younger practitioner. It's worth noting that Christine fell in love with contortion at a young age and started training at the age of four. By 14, Christine was so good, she was performing her contortion act at clubs after school, and a few years later, bending over backwards full time. Christine surprised even herself with her incredible longevity. I never imagined that I could do this for as long as this. In fact, when I was 18, I thought I'd be retiring when I was 25. But she kept going. And when I got to 25, I thought, oh, well, I'll go till I'm 30. And when I got to 30, I thought, I'll go till I'm 40. And going. And when I got to 40, I thought, I'll just keep going. And I've got no plans of retiring anytime soon. Keep going. And so here we are with no definitive answer. Such is life, such is science. Christine subverts expectations even further when she mentions feeling better while actively training and performing than when she wasn't, and this in her mid-50s. Tired of performing in venues full of dickheads, her words, not mine, she walked away from the art form. Two years later, however, she felt like a blob, her words again, stating, I didn't like where my body was headed and wanted my flexibility back. The rest? is history. And in 2016, at the time of the interview, she had no pain or arthritis at all. With a talent such as hers, it is no surprise that doctors have x-rayed her in all kinds of positions. Photos of her still appear in medical journals, though I was unable to find any during my research. She says, however, that they showed the spine of a woman half her age. Perhaps her sustainable training regimen is at the root of her continued longevity. And maybe we should all follow her example. Exercising, I mean not necessarily contorting. So if you're interested in moving and feeling better, I'd like to extend an invite to you to join me at my free online gym, Human 2.0, right here on YouTube. If you liked the video, be sure to subscribe and let me know. If you didn't, let me know the reason why in the comment section down below. As always, that's been a word from Dr. Chris, Not Your Everyday Ortho, where we see one, do one, teach one.